Each one of those guys that are gone now was a character within himself. Benny Benjamin, James Jamerson, Eddie Bongo Brown, Earl Van Dyke, Robert White, Richard Pistol Allen, and Johnny Griffith. These are the Funk Brothers no longer with us, the missing beats and the greatest hit machine in musical history. Knowing those guys uh, is, it was something special in my life. Over 30 years before their film tribute, Benny Papa Zita Benjamin was the first of the Funk Brothers to pass away. By the time he played his last beats in 1968, he was already considered a genius, the very backbeat of the Motown sound. We had many gifted drummers and percussionists at uh, Studio A. All of them would have to agree the undisputed king of rhythm was Benny Benjamin. Anytime Benny was on the set, nine times out of ten, we knew it was going to be a hit. The talent he had, I tried to almost clone Benny. <laughs> you know, I tried to, I studied him so hard. But Benny's musical gift came with a heavy price, a lifelong addiction to alcohol and drugs. If we can keep him on the bandstand, which sometimes we can't, he's out chasing corn liquor. But he could play high. Uh, he could play high better than some of these guys can play that ain't high. Benny's explosive drum sound defined Motown, and his dynamic personality earned him the love of the other brothers. But the glory and the recognition of his genius would be in a future he wasn't destined to see. That was back in the beginning days when the money wasn't as plentiful. You know, recognition was non-existent. And I can, a man with his talent, I can understand the frustration that he had. In the late 60s, before he had reached the age of 40, Benny Benjamin's addictions took his life. In the heyday of the Motown hit machine, Studio A's core beat was silenced. Now that's the guy that you had mixed emotions about. He'd get on your nerve, he worries to death, but he was a well-loved guy. If you talk to Benny Benjamin a little while, you'll love him. Equally esteemed for his maverick talent was virtuoso bassist James Jamerson. James Jamerson, in one word, a genius. Jamerson's intricate licks were revolutionary. They laid the foundation for the Motown sound and influenced generations of bassists. His talents were so vast, he humbled the very Funk Brothers themselves. When I first played with Jamerson, uh, I thought it, we were accompanying him. Was, everything was like a bass solo, and we played for him. When we played, Benny hit a groove, I hit a groove, Jamerson was grooving, and I said, he's a genius. But Jamerson shared another similarity to his percussionist counterpart, Benny Benjamin, a self-destructive addiction to alcohol. Eddie Bongo, Eddie and I went to see James. Well, he was sick. I felt so bad, I felt so bad, because he was lying in bed, and Eddie Bongo, he came over to me and said, man, this guy's not going to live past the morning. Eddie's predictions were correct. Never recognized for his true genius and ravaged by alcohol, James Jamerson was a shell of his former self. He managed to get out of bed, you know, and grab me, you know, and hug me and cry. You know, he's, I never forget this, you know. And he said uh, he wanted me to give him some money, you know, to get him something to eat. Well, I knew better. See, he wanted, <laughs> I was saying he wanted that last drink, man. You know, like I said, I'll buy you all the food you want. You can eat right here, but uh, I'm not gonna give you any money. But uh, he understood. I got home the next day, and I got the call that he had passed. James Jamerson may have had demons, but he also had dreams to be a great musician. He was more than that. In his short life, in addition to making dear friends and being a founding funk brother, he was a one-man musical legend. Jamerson just was a guy that loved life, loved living. It was fullest. That's the kind of guy he was. And he didn't know he was a genius. Had not a clue that he was a genius. 1983, the same year that James Jamerson died, also marked the loss of another funk brother, the group's comedian, Eddie Bongo Brown. Bongo could imitate anybody in the band. He'd, uh, he'd get our walk, our mannerisms, and he was a funny guy. He was, he was beautiful. Clown of the of all the, the whole bunch. He was a clown. He was definitely a clown, you know. His jokes, his talking about people, mama. Eddie originally worked as Marvin Gaye's valet, 
but eventually drummed his way into Studio A with his original conga grooves. His uncanny ability to break the tension of long, exhausting recording sessions won him the love of his fellow funks. Bongo was a very affable person, uh, full of life, very effervescent, but he had, he had his weaknesses like we all have. Eddie Bongo Brown headed out to L.A. in the mid-70s, hoping to build on his career. But like many of the funks trying to recapture Motown's glory, his most successful days were behind him, lost deep in the groove of the gold records he helped craft. I would say that you're not here, but the guys that are left here are going to do the best that, that we can to make the world know that you were there. In 1986, Alan Slutsky began his crusade to make the Funk Brothers movie. As much as he was battling their anonymity, he was also battling time. I've been fighting a biological time clock for 16 years. And uh, along the, we started out, when I first started out, we had 10 of the original 13 Funk Brothers here. But sadly, not all 10 would live to walk the red carpet at the premiere of Standing in the Shadows of Motown. The next Funk Brother to pass on was Earl Van Dyke. The passionate keyboards would earn the highest respect among the Funk Brothers. We didn't have what you call a band leader in the studio, but everybody kind of looked up to him. Like they said, he was the leader. When the session was really on the line, uh, the, the producers, uh, songwriters, and the musicians looked to Earl. A forceful pianist who played on such hits as Ain't Too Proud to Beg and My Guy, Van Dyke earned the nickname Chunk of Funk. But his ability to corral the funks, especially the elusive Benny Benjamin and James Jamison, also earned him the gratitude of Motown's management. Well, me and Earl was in the service, you know, before we even came to Motown. I already knew Earl Van Dyke in 1946. And he was, inspired me to want to be better. He found out earlier that he had cancer. And, you know, he, he wrote it out for some time. Earl Van Dyke's death in 1992 was a big loss for the Funk Brothers. They had lost their leader and friend, knowing now that he wouldn't be able to take part in the film that would celebrate the Funk Brothers' lives. I took Van Dyke, you know, like, just like he would have followed me. He's a very, very loving guy, man, you know, and, and, and you can't help but return it. Yet one more Funk Brothers would pass on before the production of the film began. Guitarist Robert White, seen in this 1993 interview. I was just so delighted to do my passion and get paid for it. Oh, my buddy Robert sat next to him numerous amount of times. Yeah, we miss him. Amid volatile personalities like Jamerson and Benjamin, Robert White was a disciplined individual. His relaxed guitar strums melded perfectly with his personal quest for higher spirituality. White, you know, he's classy. He's classy, you know, he's <laughs> Juilliard, whatever you say, might want to say, you know. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't clown around too much. Although we didn't get to participate in the filming of the movie, by the time Robert White died in 1994, he at least knew the film was becoming a reality that all his hard work would be documented in a major motion picture celebrating his mastery. It's just a delight that someone has taken an interest to introduce us as individuals to our fans. Finally, people are gonna see who we really are. In the winter of 2000, filming of Standing in the Shadows of Motown began. One of the founding drummers of the Funks, Richard Pistol Allen, was already very sick at the time yet overjoyed that he had survived long enough to see the tribute film come together. Just so that was, that was my heart. Yeah, you know, we was, we were so close together. Very beautiful guy, talent guy. Pistol was a kind person. He, uh, he was a friendly person, a warm person. When Earl, Earl passed away, we were all sitting around a table. Pistol was sitting to the left of me, and he kissed me on the cheek. And I, I could never forget that. Never. In this rare footage of that 1994 wake, Pistol talks about the subtle differences in the drumming styles of the Motown percussionists. To identify the drummers down in Motown, to identify you, you got to hear, and identify Benny, that thing. Identify me, simple. 
a small town. The chatty, well-loved drummer Sticks was silenced in June of 2002, but not until after filming of the movie was complete. He went with the satisfaction of knowing he would finally be immortalized. He was sick through the whole filming, and he just, if you look at him on the, on the film, he was in heaven. He was in heaven already. In November of 2002, Standing in the Shadows of Motown was released. After all the years, all the hits, the surviving Funk Brothers basked in the glory of fame and recognition. No one enjoyed it more than keyboardist Johnny Griffin. There's a lot of love between me and the guys. When Al came up with the idea and said, it's going to happen, I said, well, you count me in. Along with the remaining Funk Brothers, Johnny attended the premieres and the concerts, thrilled at the rush of fame hitting him so late in life. But then, in the middle of the celebration, tragedy struck. When we were in Detroit, I was getting ready for the premiere. He was not feeling well for a while. I think Jack called me about 11 o'clock Sunday morning. He was on the way to the hospital. And, and I said, is he OK? And, I'll, and he said, no, he, he's, he's passed away. And I, Well, I didn't say nothing for three or four minutes, just thinking, you know, could it be a mistake? And then I knew Johnny was sick. It's, 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 it was so quick, you can't, you, you still, I can't believe it, I can't comprehend that he's gone. Like, you know, like tonight, we talking and laughing and everything, we getting up in the morning to go do a shoot, and Johnny can't come, Johnny's no longer with us. It was just weeks before, as the Funk Brothers dined, readying for the release of the film that they speculated on such a loss. Now the unthinkable had happened. I don't know. I would, I would feel worse than I ever did in my life if something would happen to one of the rest of the guys right now. But I don't think I could. I could yeah. think it could happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I'm sure Johnny would want us to go on. We want him to know that He's right there with us. And we don't control anything. Our fates are in the hands of someone else. And that we'll carry on the name of the Funk Brothers, because he said, I'm a Funk Brother forever. And he is a Funk Brother forever. We'll continue on. His name is in the history just as much as ours, because he did finish the picture. Want him to know that we're going out there, and uh, Anything we do is going to be for him as well as all the other guys. Motown's hits play eternal on our radios and in our hearts. Now the men who played those hits have their piece of eternity. And for Benny, James, Eddie, Earl, Robert, Pistol, and Johnny, it was all they ever wanted in the first place. When you say what about the ones that are not here, we're hurting, but we don't dwell on it. We continue on, we talk like they're not really gone. We yeah, love them to death. Yeah, they'll always be with us.